The real reason we're here tonight is to hear somebody that's got a special message. The task of really introducing Anne Gadwell Nicodemus is impossible. I am flummoxed by her productivity. She is too fierce to grasp in words. Looking at the sun doesn't tell you much about the sun, and it hurts your eyes. <laughs> to appreciate the sun, you must look about to see what it does for the world. And Anne is like that. I can't tell you much about her, but I can say something about the effect that she's had on all of us. We didn't know who she was, just some creative place-making person. Well, then I tried to find out about who, what fish we had landed. You know, who was this Anne? <laughs> I ran into a wall of publications. She writes and writes and writes, evaluations, case studies, articles, book chapters, scholarly papers, commissioned reports. But I found out that before all that verbiage was movement, Researching Anne, I came across an arresting photograph of her in her 20s, looking a lot like the yes, dancing she Shiva. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Performing the piece which I assume she wrote, I Dream of Monster Babies. <laughs> she wasn't always exactly as she is tonight. 20 years ago, Anne was studying biology and dance at Oberlin. Not long afterwards, she was the artistic director of Mad Science Pub uh, Productions in New York, where she created and directed and produced original dance performances. Next, she became the financial manager and of a puppet and mask theater. Don't laugh, it had a million dollar budget. And then something to happen. There was a sea change. She earned a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Minnesota. You know that had to have an effect on a an artistic personality. Afterwards, she started talking about, I'm going to read carefully here, subnationally representative data sets and multi-site evaluation studies. That's what she does these days. You're about to hear from a woman who is simultaneously an artist, an accountant, an administrator, and an extraordinary analytical thinker. In 2010, she and co-author Anne Markison coined the term that has had a profound effect on today's thinking about economic development and the arts. Creative placemaking swept through the arts world, touching the highest reaches of the National Endowment for the Arts, the huge local initiative support corporation, colloquially known as LISC, and the Kresge Foundation. The concept spawned the National Consortium of, for Creative Placemaking, whose director was a uh, participant in this morning's program, and inspired hundreds, I say hundreds, of community development projects. These days you can earn a certificate in it. The brief but eventful history of creative placemaking proves that ideas have consequences. So. Please welcome the mother of creative placemaking, Anne Gadwa Nicodemus. Good evening. I've never had an introduction quite like that before. <laughs> it's, it's amazing what you can find online these days. Uh, thank you, Joseph. So today we're talking about creative placemaking, and on a more serious note, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight um, and to acknowledge the Lenape, the natives who lived on this land before the Europeans and invite their spirits into this space. So my name is Anne Gadwin Nicodemus and I am principal and CEO of Metros Arts Consulting. Um, and it's just a few hours east of here on I-80 in Easton, Pennsylvania. And just very briefly, we believe in the power of culture to enrich people's lives and help communities thrive. We believe those benefits should be broadly shared and inclusively developed. We strive to provide high caliber planning, research, and evaluation services to reveal arts impacts 
and to help communities equitably improve cultural vitality. And to accelerate change, we seek to share knowledge and amplify the voices of those closest to the work. Sharing knowledge and amplifying the voices of those closest to the work. That's just what I hope to be able to do with you tonight. So tonight I'll offer a framework for local communities to harness their arts and cultural assets to equitably advance their community development objectives. It's called creative placemaking. And as Joseph said, um, I had the privilege of developing this white paper for the National Endowment for the Arts with Anne Marcuson in 2010. Uh, and here is the definition that I co-authored, uh, included in, in the, um, the paper. So in creative placemaking, partners from the public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical and social character of a neighborhood, tribe, town, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. So there are three main parts. It's pl a place-based orientation, strategic action by cross-sector partners, and a core of arts and cultural activities. And the challenge is really finding that sweet spot of shared value between um, what often may be strange bedfellows, um, partners that aren't used to working together, but challenging them to find new ways to think about art in public space and in civic life, um, figuring out what is of importance to your planning department or to your elected officials or to, you know, maybe it's the uh, recycling transfer station. Who can you reach out to and work with in new ways um, using arts and cultural strategies to address community needs? <clears throat> Our definition also spoke to outcomes. Creative placemaking animates public and private, animates structures and streetscapes. It improves local business vitality and public safety, and it brings together diverse people to celebrate, inspire, and be inspired. So this definition um, included economic impacts, it included social impacts, and it included uh, the intrinsic benefits of arts and culture. So it was sort of a big tent concept. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that since that time, Practice and thinking has evolved. Um, there are many definitions now in operation. Um, and there's been, the, the practice has evolved to have an even greater emphasis placed on grassroots resident-centered initiatives. So if you look at the initial definition, it was partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors. I mean, the sort of grassroots people residents, small business owners, weren't explicitly emphasized in this definition, so I think to its weakness. Um, I also wanted to point out that there has been pushback on the term placemaking. Um, a lot of people think that it is about making a place creative. We always intended the creative to be an adverb on the making so that the process is creative. It's not that you arrive at a destination and now you have a creative place and before it wasn't a place or it wasn't a creative place. But that has rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. The term has become tarnished in, and closely conflated with gentrification in some, some uh, circles. So I wanted to just acknowledge that and also um, point out that this pushback on the term place making, some have rejected it in favor of place keeping. So the emphasis is on both creating and preserving inclusive communities with equitable opportunities for all. So just to sort of center, center the work today where we're at, those are some, some key concepts for the folks that are really steeped in this work and practice. Artists. Artists are at the center of this work. This cover slide image is Fifth Ward Jam. It's by Houston-based artists Dan Havel and Dean Ruck. So why did I choose this image? Artists can make the old new. They can see potential where some perceive waste. They can create beauty. And tonight we'll talk about how they can serve as unique, effective, and underappreciated leaders in community development. I see some heads nodding, that's a good sign. Um, but what else do we think about with regards to artists and community transformation? Gentrification? Does that, that resonate with people? Gentrification and displacement, which is the, 
the most sort of averse as aspect of gentrification are complex dynamics. They're driven by metro level housing supply and demand. They're driven by your, your entire regional economy. And they're also affected by um, historic and present day policy, whether that's federal policy or local policy. Uh, and yet, um, a lot of times, artists are closely associated with this concept. Here are the headlines. These should, probably won't come as a surprise to you. The popular press likes to frame artists first as urban pioneers, and that term pioneers is kind of problematic in and of itself, um, and then as victims. So just briefly, why do we have these, these what I like to call sticky myths and slippery realities surrounding artists and gentrification? Well, one reason is that despite their low incomes, society views artists as privileged, white. It's an elitist occupation. They're highly educated. They might be starving, but it's poverty by choice, right? Now, of course, artists aren't all white. You know, they, they live in communities many times in which they work. They're many times of, they're of their community. But um, on average, they are, statistically, they are highly educated and they are low income. So it's this interesting dynamic. And on an individual basis, artists, arts organizations, and arts enterprises really vary in terms of their roles in neighborhood change. So some artists and arts organizations or enterprises um, enter with their eyes open into relationships with private developers, who some of whom are really trying to engineer gentrification or displacement. So I, I like to call those, you know, the ones that are complicit. Uh, others are more what you might call agnostic. You know, they're artists or arts venues that have no interest in broader placemaking agendas. They just want to present their traditional art objects and create them or performances. Um, and sort of the effects it may or may not have in terms of neighborhood change. I mean, it's just kind of it happening. Uh, whereas others still are what I like to call antitheticals. So these are artists and arts organizations that actively employ creative pro practices to try to lessen disparities and to advance <laughs> inclusive community building agendas. So those are the sorts of examples I'd like to share with you tonight to just get your kind of hopefully blow your minds a little bit about the role that artists can play in community development. So even folks that have drunk the Kool-Aid and are working in community development tend often to see artists, the role of artists in fairly limited ways. They paint murals. They might um, work in youth development, right? Those are sort of the, the low-hanging fruit, the things that we immediately think of. Um, but artists can contribute much more profoundly, especially if they're given the authority to act in leadership roles. So through some recent research with local initiative support corporation, LISC, uh, Metro surfaced some critical skills that artists embody as leaders in community development. Artists can surface community knowledge by asking questions and listening deeply. They use imagination and vision to bring fresh eyes to community work. They can help community members advance into leadership roles. They're adept at collaborating in cross-sectoral teams. And they're prepared for the uncertainty risk and risk inherent in community change. Now, not all artists. I mean, even if you're oriented in this direction, you might not have these skills. Or you could be you know, the uh, complicit or the agnostic anyway. But, um, I want to touch on a couple of artists we profiled to demonstrate how they embody and use these critical skills. So the People's Paper Co-op in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Faith Bartley. She's the lead fellow at the People's Paper Co-op in North Philadelphia, which is a unique way to address the hardships people who have been formerly incarcerated face when they return to their communities. In clinics co-designed by lawyers and formerly incarcerated folks, participants work to expunge their criminal records. And then they tear up these records. A food blender is involved. And they make handmade paper. The clinics transform, typically dehumanizing and disempowering social service experiences, 
into an environment where an individual struggle turns into shared power. The success of this project hinges on artist leadership, which permeates almost every layer of the project. The People's Paper Co-op originated from an artist residency in a program in the Village of Arts and Humanity that matched, matches visiting artists with neighborhood residents to create art projects that lift up the community. Through spaces, two artists, Courtney Bowles and Mark Strandquist, arrived from Richmond, Virginia, with lots of questions and open ears. The People's Paper Co-op emerged from the question, how would re-entry services, policies, and stereotypes be transformed if they were crafted by those with direct experience? Bowles and Strandquist don't just lead a program, they, they seek to build the capacity of community members, particularly of other artists. Enter Faith. She, she grew up in the neighborhood and ended up in prison. And as the lead fellow, she feels like she's found her niche. She says she's giving back to the neighborhood that she helped destroy. And as a full-time lead fellow at the helm of People's Paper Co-op, she's helping Bowles and Strand, Strandquist realize one of their personal marks of success, working themselves out of a job as neighborhood residents increasingly assume the ownership and direction of the project. Now we'll travel to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Pillsbury House Plus Theater is a community theater and social service agency that primarily serves four neighborhoods in South Minneapolis. And one of Pillsbury House's creative, creative placemaking programs is Art Blocks, which engages artists to creatively connect with other artists on the block where they live. And it stemmed from the block captain model. Uh, and in art blocks, artists and their immediate neighbors were encouraged to explore creativity on this very micro scale, thus getting to know each other and build a stronger sense of community. Artists get support from Pillsbury staff, which includes previous art block artists who have grown into leadership roles within the organization. The artists have completed a variety of projects, They've written poems for each person on their block. They've created films and showed them in backyards. They've engaged youth in creative projects. And they've researched the history of houses on their blocks and created tin types of houses. Art blocks sprung from a cross-sector group spearheaded by Pillsbury House Plus Theater, which includes city council members, a neighborhood organization, a small business owner, an independent, and an independent artist. And one of the art block artists and staff members at Pillsbury House Theater says that these cross-sector partnerships are what makes the work possible. He says, it's about knowing what you know, recognizing what you don't know, and aligning with smarter people who know what you don't know. In our Not Just Murals prof publication, we profile more artists and also talk about how communities can cultivate environments in which artists can assume leadership in community development. And so I encourage you to download it from metrosarts.com. But just to recap, let's look again, let's quickly revisit these critical skills um, that artists can embody as leaders in community development. The People's Paper Co-op really hits on all of these first three. The program emerged uh, from Courtney Bowles and Mark Strandquist asking questions and listening deeply to community knowledge. Imagination and vision bring fresh eyes. The clinics transforms dehumanizing social service experiences into an experience of, of um, shared power. So that was completely that example. And helping community members advance into leadership roles. Faith Bartley herself, formerly incarcerated, she's now the lead fellow. So Art Blocks hits on several of these as well, and is, is also an excellent example of the ways in which artists can be effective collaborators in cross-sectoral teams. So I think I'm just gonna pause there for a second and ask you to look at this list and ask a few people to just reflect. Do these resonate for you? Are there others that you would add to the list in terms of the ways that artists can lead in community development? Well, in the People's Paper Co-op, they spent a lot of time um, talking, talking to the neighborhoods, listening, you know, first, before talking, sitting on the stoop of the storefront, opening the space, um, and yes, door, you know, knocking door to doors. 
Yeah, and again, not, not every artist is skilled in all of these regards, but for the ones that lead in community development, these are, these are some of the common elements. Does anything, yes, go ahead. So um, for Pillsbury House Theater, they had an advisory committee and it had a city council member, neighborhood organization, a small business owner, and an independent artist. And so um, multi-sectoral in terms of public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, these, you know, you could even expand it to say cross um, mission. So maybe it's all public sector, uh, they're public sectors, but it's people from public works and people, you know, they, there can be a lot of siloing even within one sector, but it's really about reaching out and finding unusual partners to try to advance a shared vision. Yeah, I would encourage when you're coming up with teams or committees for a particular project, think about including artists or designers as part of that brain trust. You, we often think about them as sort of coming in at the last minute, icing on the cake, they're gonna put a, a bow on it or you know, a band-aid for urban spaces. We think about the, art, the creative product being the point. But, but it, could it could be the creative process that's often more valuable. Um, there was a, a person, I'm blanking on his name, but the former director of the Phoenix Public Art Program said that the, the value of including an artist is, ask, is leaving space to ask the impertinent question, right? So just having someone who thinks about things differently and say, like, why, you know, questions the status quo, turns things around, brings elements of the creative process to the work, I think you'll be surprised at how, at how it can benefit not just the product, but the process. So we're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into three more examples of how communities have worked with artists and specifically to imagine historic places. This is the old house fair after all and provide spaces where artists and other community members can come together to make and experience culture. So let's go to Cleveland. Uh, the North Shore Collinwood neighborhood in Cleveland has become an attractive place for artists largely because uh, the North, Shore development, North Shore's Community Development Corporation offers renter equity and purchase initiatives for residential and commercial properties as well as community facilities revitalization. Ink House is one such example. Zygot Press, a local print shop, took advantage of North, Northeast Shore's programs to, to renovate this formerly vacant house. Now it's a work studio exhibition space um, that's used for fine edition printing, which is the only such service available in the region. And there are also residential projects too. So this is musician Moira Rogers, and as we were trying to sort of understand everything that happened in, um, in the Collinwood neighborhood, there's a lot going on, so it was particularly effective for us to try to trace these policy changes and nonprofit initiatives through the lens of one artist family. So I'll sort of walk you through uh, Moira's story. So she moved to Cleveland's North Shore Collinwood neighborhood in 2011. She and her girlfriend were in search of affordable live work space and Collinwood was on Roger's radar screen because of its importance in the Cleveland music scene. So she moved into the Glen Cove, which was a six unit affordable live work studio building developed by the CDC, the Northeast Shores Community, Northeast Shores Development Corporation, where tenants actually earned renter equity and collaborate and exchange information about resources and opportunities with one another and the Northeast Shores CDC. So Moira has become very involved in the community. She gets paid to play local gigs. She produced an album with the help of a local rent recording engineer and Northeast Shores even commissioned her to write a song for a unique grants opportunity, a grant proposal. So Roger's girlfriend then, Jessica Pinsky, has also worked with Northeast Shores opening Praxis, which is a fabric art gallery and studio in a commercial space in Collinwood's quarter square mile Waterloo Arts District. And Pinsky also purchased a home with the assistance from North, Northeast Shores Development Corporation. She accessed a neighborhood <coughs> stabilization program subsidy and energy efficiency, energy efficiency upgrades. 
So it's a lot, a lot of different things that this just one artist family could take advantage of. Other artists have also taken advantage of um, the CDC's $8,500 home program, which offers oppor an opportunity to purchase for no down payment uh, in exchange for requirements that the buyers contribute sweat equity and participate in home buying class. And it's open to all, but they found that um, it's been proven to be a great match, particularly for artists, many of whom had some cash savings and good credit scores, but lacked the work and uh, credit history to be able to get a conventional mortgage. So they were a really good fit for this, for this program. So through this home buyer assistance program, uh, the CDC has helped 15 artists achieve home ownership. And through the region's first renter equity program, renters too can build wealth through their housing expenditures. So in just over five years, the Northeast Shore has supported the launch of more than 300 community arts projects. So it's a lot to try to wrap your head around. So um, beyond supporting the artists, these efforts have also helped to stabilize a weak real estate market driven by Collinwood's large historic population loss. So the equivalence of one resident every 56 hours for 70 years left Collinwood's from 1940 to 2010. And the Waterloo Commercial Corridor, which was 40% vacant, was, was as recently as 1999, is now 94% occupied. And with businesses that are 100% locally owned and operated, they're very proud of that. And Waterloo also benefited from a $5.5 million streetscape improvement, an investment of the, by the city of Cleveland and the state of Ohio, but one that they probably wouldn't have made were it not for the investments that artists were already making there. So again, that's one of these, these uh, instances where public sector investments sort of followed grassroots um, and non, uh, the nonprofit CDC energy and activity. So Northeast Shores is currently spearheading a very large rehab of the old LaSalle Theater. And when complete, it will house three new storefronts, a high-tech multi-use community room and theater space, and six apartments. So I invite you to read more about Northeast Shores and other efforts that involve creative placemaking and community economic development in our More Than Storefronts report, which was also written in collaboration with LISC. And now we're gonna head to Ajo, Arizona. So the International Sonora Desert Alliance, or ISDA, is a non-art specific organization, but it's been lucky enough to receive grant funding for creative placemaking through Art Place and the National Endowment for the Arts. And it's used creative placemaking to bring people together, activate spaces that hold historic importance and spur cultural tourism. So let me just give you some context. Ajo, Arizona is a rural town with about 3,300 year-round residents. It's of the Tohono O'odham Nation, the second largest Indian nation in the United States. Phoenix is about two hours northeast, and the U.S.-Mexico border is 40 miles to the south. So as you might imagine, Ajo is tri-national. There are people there of Mexican, Native, and Anglo descent. So it's an old mining town with a history of segregation, in both in terms of housing and jobs. So historically, natives had access to the most dangerous jobs. Mexicans had access to better jobs, and only Anglos could be the managers. And during this time, the only place where people gathered across racial and ethnic difference were the town plazas and schools. And now many of those places are on the National Registry of Historic Places. So about 10 years ago, local artists asked uh, ISDA to adopt and renovate an old school into artist live work spaces. So ISDA worked with Art Space, an organization that develops artist housing, live work space, and other art spaces. And ISDA held a community meeting where 400 people showed up to discuss the future of the school. It attracted people by incorporating local arts organizations and artisans into the meeting. And Art Space challenged ISDA to raise a lot of money, $9.6 million, which took some time. It took 3.5 years. And during that time, 
ISDA used arts and culture to animate the school and to create a broad sense of community ownership. They organized workshops, they painted murals, and they hosted events in front of the school. Now, after 18 months of construction in which contractors were required to hire locally, now there's an indoor, the community indoor-outdoor performance space, and the artist live workspace is currently full. And ISDA is now also working on renovating Ajo Plaza, which is also on the National Registry of Historic Places, which will have spaces for local artists to sell their wares, tourists to stay, and a commercial kitchen. And when it came time for construction, ISDA leveraged dollars for the creative facilities to develop a workforce development and GED program. So even though Ajo isn't segregated anymore, there's still a difference in income. About 30% of the entire Ajo population is low income, but 76% of the native population is low income. And in ISDA's workforce development program, young people learned how to make instruments, tiles for murals, and garden. And ISDA developed a registered apprentice program in building maintenance and repair, so young people work towards a 4,000 hour certificate. And all participants in the program go through a peer support process where they develop financial skills. So I think this is an excellent opportunity, uh, example of how you can root an initiative in arts and culture and tie in a lot of other broad-based, inclusive uh, community objectives. So the workforce development program, the um, GED program, you know, just crossing these uh, cultural divides in terms of race and ethnicity and bringing people together around the commons of the public space and these historic facilities. So I think this is a, a one to watch. All right, our last example is um, in Macon, Georgia, where a community is experiencing an arts-focused revitalization at a very micro-neighborhood scale. So years ago, the Mill Hill, Mill Hill neighborhood adjacent to downtown Macon bustled with mill activity. Then the mill closed, and a highway made a rift between it and downtown, and more than 50% of the homes in Mill Hill now sit vacant like this one. But the local urban development authority recently acquired many of the vacant homes and the Macon Arts Alliance was ready to embark on a planning process to rehab 14 homes for sale to artists and create a community arts center in the old mill auditorium. So Macon has a history of urban renewal and top-down planning with a resulting legacy of distrust. And they wanted to have a transparent and creative planning process to envision the neighborhood around these rehab projects. And the partners really struggled to walk that line between engaging the small population that currently lived in Mill Hill with the creative people they wished to attract to the neighborhood. Organizers recruited two artists in residence from out of town to come and live and create in the neighborhood but they soon left, citing concerns about participating in, quote, art washing. The Macon Arts Alliance, meanwhile, described a scenario where plans moved forward too quickly and where miscommunication and unfinished homes in Mill Hill for the artists resulted in the artists living in a downtown loft. But the team quickly recovered and adjusted as necessary. However, hiring a a firm to produce a cultural plan and engaging an artist partner with family ties to the neighborhood who facilitated arts programming with kids at the community center. And one early result was an innovative data gathering technique called the roving listeners, where a group of Mill Hill residents who walked through the neighborhood interviewed residents to identify talents among neighbors. And the information they gathered helped guide the Mill Hill plan. So the Macon Arts Alliance has now hired its first artist in residence for the Mill Hill Community Arts Center. And here's the interior. And these artists in residence are charged with programming for the space, including at least one free event per month. Artists from across the country applied for the position, but Macon Arts Alliance ended up hiring a local uh, husband, and wife, a husband and wife pair who moved to Macon a year ago. And after one month, the artists are working to fill the gallery spaces with work from local artists. So the local historic preservation entity serves 
as a developer. And using historic tax credits, along with other funding sources, have rehabbed several of the 14 parcels. Future plans include Pink Zone for the Mill Hill neighborhood and overlay district to allow residents to have retail at home with commercial access and light manufacturing, such as making and selling baked goods in their, in their own homes. And artist homeowners will participate in a community land trust with the goal of ensuring long-term housing affordability. So I want to pause there again for a moment and just ask if, um, if any of the examples and stories you've heard so far spark any ideas for you, for here, for Bellefonte, or for the State College region. This last case study um, is part of our work for the Center for Community Progress, specifically examining how um, creative placemaking can be used to uh, address vacant property revitalization goals. And I think it varies a lot um, state by state. So, um, you know, but you have people from the city council here who could probably answer, you know, what the, the possibilities are. You know, some, some municipalities have a separate redevelopment authority. Um, so they're, the, I'm actually not the expert on all of, all of that, but um, does anyone have some information that, that maybe you can connect with if you raise your hands and can kind of give, give the, the lowdown? Uh, I'm seeing people point it out. Yes. All right. All right, so uh, raise your hands so people can come find you. Okay. Maybe uh, artist for cross-sector collaboration down the road. Thank you. Take it away, Vicky. Tall and short. I can say that uh, the CEDACOG, the Susquehanna Economic Development Association Council of Governments, which is a multi-county organization, at the time I was president, had monies available and personnel to go out and help to um, restore some of these abandoned uh, industries and also uh, some housing at that time. So I think that that program, although I'm not intimately involved now, there's surely some form of that that still exists. And Mark, I don't know if you're familiar with any of the funds that's going on there now. Sorry, but but well the ideas are there so I think they could be resurrected and there was a, a plan for that at one time that I mean we're this is about dreaming tonight and, and being inspired to talk about how can we help this um, to happen again so the framework is there um, and a lot of what you talked about reminded me of Habitat for Humanity, where people who wanted to put sweat equity into the renovation of uh, abandoned houses or new houses could then um, get so much credit for the hours that they spent working on these houses. And so there's another example. So you put a few of these cross-section of, of ideas together and um, that's something we can certainly put our heads together and be inspired by you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And there's, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of nonprofit community development organizations and what are called uh, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Intermediaries, institutions, people correct me. But um, so, going to get the details wrong, but uh, basically, you know, banks weren't lending to people that lived in their own areas. I mean, particularly black and brown people weren't getting mortgages. And so there were laws put into place and, you know, that should have been corrected. And then uh, these funds were then sort of funneled at the federal level into entities like LISC and Enterprise and NeighborWorks to try to uh, fuel sort of the nonprofit community development sector trying to address some of some of these long-term challenges around um, disinvestment uh, in certain neighborhoods that were legacies of redlining and you know other sort of structural changes in the economy. Uh, so there there are a lot of models out there, and what I guess I would just try to encourage people to uh, you you are not going to be sort of I mean I I don't know exactly what your background is or but there, it gets very technical, and so you can't be a master of 
a, if you're a jack of all trades, you're a master of none, right? So, but it's trying to figure out who the right people are in your locality to ask these questions. All right, how do community development block grants work? Where would I start? Or what's, you know, what is a new market tax credit? What is that? And, you know, can you apply for us? So, you know, or just trying to sort of navigate what the instruments and tools might be available to you. So um, having uh, what's called like an om ombudsman type role in city government, uh, someone that people can go to and just figure out how to navigate some of these systems could be really valuable. And, uh, and I wanted to share another model that I think is interesting is the community land trust model where you know, a nonprofit will, um, will do you, did you want to say, yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so a nonprofit will purchase the properties and actually own the land, and then the uh, owner occupant purchase the house, but not the land. And so it keeps the, the cost of ownership more affordable and sort of takes out some of the speculatory nature, um, but still allows uh, that resident and owner to build equity. So there are a lot of interesting models out there that can be applied. Along those lines, um, in Center County, we do have the first time home buyers program where you can borrow money uh, for your down payment and your closing costs. And then when you live in the property for a certain period of time and it's sold, then you pay that money back into that revolving loan fund. So that type of structure does exist now. That's great. We, we have plenty of money in that fund, please apply. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> and it was a great, um, that I'm proud to say came into being when I was commissioner because we got the banks involved, so it became a private-public partnership to figure out how can we do this with, without um, going against the, the banking industry. Yeah. We made them partners of how we put this, this form together. And so I think that is also used, that program is used along with other banking programs so they get, they're able to be used together. So I, as some people aren't aware of it, so we need to spread that word that you can get into when you don't have down payment money, don't give up because that money is there. Okay, you all have to tell a friend. Yes, we used to have a program like that. Not so much a program where you got money, but that we used to have a focus. This, this happened how many years ago? Tell us, tell us what you should talk about. I'm talking about bringing the art. Artscape. It's very artscape. Yeah, artscape. And, um, and so, we, we got a number of, of groups together, and we, got, uh, we actually had people who moved here because of that. Uh, somehow it's fallen away by the side, by the wayside. I have, still have artists in my apartments uh, from that program, and uh, hmm. they're very appreciative, and uh, they're at the university, and so if you connect with them in any way, uh, I, I, because mine are getting ready to go out into the world. <laughs> a little head. I mean, if I'm the head, and they're going out. So anyway, so, that, so um, there are things that we can do, I think. Things that you've done in the past you yes, might yeah. revisit? Yeah, it worked out. It, and the, it's the sending out the information, looking into what we, you can help somebody do if, you, if they want to. Um, it's not just for, uh, you know, the elite uh, 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 artists. It's for anybody we get, you know, we well, it's personally very uh, gratifying to see that the connections have are already being made, the ideas are sparking. No, but I mean, in this conversation, there's excitement and, um, and some momentum building. So thank you, and I hope, I hope it keeps going. I actually have a final um, parting note. So I, I travel a lot for work, and it's come up a few times today. People, people like to ask, where are you from? And I, I mean, I have a feeling that a lot of people in this room are, well, let's just see, are, are you from Bellefonte or State College, show of hands? Now or, now or 
Well, that's, that's, yes. So that's interesting, right? So who is a native? Ah, OK. Now, who, who considers that they're from, but not native, from? That's really interesting. So I live in Easton, Pennsylvania. And I've been there about seven years. And I love it. And it, it is home, but it, I'm not from there. Um, and I'm interested in this question of, um, of belonging and sort of when you can claim a place. Uh, New York City, I've heard that it's the fastest place people claim. Like, oh, I'm from New York. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, and actually, when I lived in Brooklyn in my, in my 20s, I did say I'm from New York when I, when I would be touring with my dance stuff. Um, so anyhow, you know, where, where are you from? When can you claim a place? Go ahead. Okay. I live a couple miles up the road. It's close to 38 years I've been there. So I'm from here, but there's no way I'm local. Mm. Okay, and so then there are those places where you're not from unless you have grandparents in the graveyard, right? So it sounds like that might be some of the dynamic here. But we did see a show of hand, native, but I'm from here. So I think that's promising. I think that's promising. So just to share, this is where I feel I'm from. This is uh, my grandparents' farm where my, um, my grandfather grew up, my mom grew up. I spent lots of every summer as a child. And um, it's nestled on the north shore of Long Island near the, his, in the scenic Nisiquag River by the Long Island Sound. Um, that's me as a kid in the mud puddle. That's me as an adult on the tractor. Uh, so this is where I feel I'm from, even though um, my family, no one lives there. We actually, unfortunately, had to sell the property um, a few years ago. And we're scattered all over the country and even globe. Um, so when is it that you're from a place? Now, it's also changed a lot since my great-grandfather, actually, my great-grandfather was the one who bought the farm. Um, and this is, you know, an old map. And this is downtown Smithtown, uh, about a mile and a half um, away from, from that farm, which looks pretty much the same way as it did in the pictures. And what's striking about this picture to me is, you know, it's, it's anywhere USA, right? I mean, so one of the things that I'd like to, like to leave you with is, um, distinctiveness and how arts and culture can sort of be a tool in your toolbox to shape a community um, and make it distinctive. But the challenge is how do you still foster that sense of belonging and inclusiveness in that process so that people are of a place, they're from a place. And I think that it's a lot of it has to do with your ability to try to your ability to influence that change. I mean, a lot of times you feel like communities change for better, for worse, and it's just happening to you, whether it's market forces or the government or, you know. But if you have the power to, to influence the direction, then it allows you to claim a place. Um, I also want to talk to you about gumbo. <laughs> so I've had the, the honor of visiting Acadiana in Louisiana a few times. Actually, New News in Arnidville is one of the case studies that was featured in the white paper um, for the NEA and on creative placemaking in 2010. And when I was there, I learned about gumbo. Um, now, this dish is unique in that it has Native American, French, Spanish, German, all of these different influences, African influences in the dish. And each element is distinctive. You can taste it. But the combination of, of them all is more delicious than in isolation. So they're all additive. They're all adding to make this distinctive dish. And I love, love to think about this metaphor. Because when I grew up, you know, I heard, you know, this is a country of immigrants. We were a melting pot. And I always had the image of my head of this congealed fondue pot with lots of gooey cheese, the melting pot. So as you're striving for community change, I just encourage you to try to figure out um, the ways to do that in, in a ways that are inclusive and foster belonging and equitable change. Uh, so. Creative place making, yes, but please be like gumbo. <laughs>
Thank you. And thank you to Joseph and Mary. It's been a pleasure and honor. Let me just make an observation about what was special about this keynote address. Um, Anne got us talking. She pulled us into the conversation. And we've had some really stem-winding presentations here in past years by wonderful orators, and they, they were great. But tonight was a little bit different. A lot of people stood up. A lot of people made suggestions. And we could stop it. As soon as she walks out the door, we could just go back and forget everything. Or we could try to get this little push and, and, and go a little further down the road. We do, we've been doing this once a year for a couple of years now, but once a year is not enough. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make things change. But clearly, there were ideas in the past that worked. There are ideas in this room right now that worked, in spite of the 60% layoff at CEDACOG. But there are still possibilities for us to change this community. And Anne has mentioned lots of possibilities, given us lots of examples. And it can be done, but the question is, will we do it? So thanks for coming. We really appreciate the, the turnout, and I, I hope you learned something, and I hope you'll do something with what you learned. Thank you very much. <laughs>